University of Oregon School of Law, um, and he has a practice here in town. Um, and Quentin Schroeder is, he has numerous, he has a, Quentin, what's your degree in? Religious Studies, Masters in Religious Studies. And um, really a brilliant guy, but a very entertaining speaker. Um, he, he'll tell his story today, so you'll get plenty of background on Quentin. So without anything further, I'll hand it over to Matt. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, there's a lot of things that we do at NAMI with varying levels of importance. And uh, I, I really think that talking to attorneys is valuable. And the reason why I think that is because I'm an attorney and I was faced with a lot of conditions or a lot of interactions in the legal system that involve mental illness and I didn't realize it. I thought I did. <laughs> thought I had a pretty solid grasp of about everything and then life shows you that you don't. And um, for, for me that came, I guess it was uh, in 2007, I, I, I had a, a loved one that uh, my, my stepbrother had come back from Ur Iraq and was living with uh, P PTSD. And I, none of us really got it. Like we didn't really understand the depths of what was going on. Uh, I I'd even worked in the behavioral health field but, but before, but a lot of that field doesn't understand it. And, um, and there was some parts of it that I, there was one critical thing that I didn't know and, and I didn't understand what exactly it meant for a brain to be affected by mental illness, to actually have it change how the person thinks, feels, and acts. I, I couldn't conceptualize that. I didn't, you know, I think I, I, I could get it in theory, but the reality of that, and when it played out with our family, I, I, I remember I did all the things that you were supposed to do uh, in terms of helping get a counselor, helping to get this and that in place, and, and when those things weren't followed, I, it, I thought, okay, rationally, he knows that I'm available and when he's ready he'll come to me and we'll attack this just like any other case or anything else and that was my lack of understanding of mental illness my lack of understanding of what happens when a brain's actually affected in a biological way that affects how a person thinks feels and acts and that was an error and within three weeks, he, he was gone. We, we lost him to a suicide. And I didn't really understand how and why and what happened until I took the NAMI Family to Family course. And after I took that course, I realized <coughs> from a legal aspect, we're, we're required to kind of fight the fights of society. And especially the people in, in this room. And it's supposed to be set up in a rational way and people are rewarded for doing rational things and punished for doing in a rational way is at least the goal as I've seen it. And how does that fit when someone's brain's not allowing them to act rationally? And how does it affect your interactions with your clients? Because I know our folks, the 1 in 17 people affected with serious mental illness are really involved with the legal system. So I, what, what we'll do is I'll start out by having Quentin Schroeder talk about his experiences. And there's no better way to understand what someone's actually going through and their, uh, uh, other than hearing about their lived experiences. And then I'll do a quick presentation on... Um, the basics uh, of the illnesses, what to do when 
when you have someone who's really symptomatic, I'm sure some of you have had clients really struggling in your office and just some do's and don'ts and then we'll have some time for questions. So, Quinn. A little bit of background. I come from a fledgling new newcomer Montana family of 60 years who were proactive in political and artistic circles. My father was county attorney in Kalispell and Flathead County for several terms. My mother received the Life Achievement Award from Helena's Myrna Loy Center for the Performing Arts in 1998. I have an older brother who is a retired civil, excuse me, a civil engineer living in Summers, Montana. And Matt Kuntz and I try to bring order out of chaos on a daily basis at the NAMI Center. Every person who experiences the onslaught of a mental disorder has a story, and every story has its own valid uniqueness. This is my brief narrative, and is simply a variation on a theme. Perhaps I ought to state the following disclaimer. All of my varied psychoses were not induced or exacerbated by either illicit drugs or alcohol. All of those psychoses were completely natural which, depending on your perspective, could be either a plus or a minus. My propensity toward mental illness first became manifest during my second undergraduate year at the University of Chicago. Out of the blue, so to speak, I became apathetic and lethargic and I, regarding this pursuit of my studies. I found I could not concentrate, nor could I focus long enough to be able to comprehend any of my academic requirements. My mind seemed to be spinning constantly, and I was losing my verve for the intellectual stimulation which I found so enticing during my first year at that particular university. I turned day into night, and to escape, I would wander around Hyde Park after midnight. Not a good idea. I would sleep during my classes and frequently engaged in suicidal ideation. For this work, the University of Chicago, in all its wisdom, granted me four F's. I'd never seen so many F's in a row in my entire life. My mother called me up from Montana. Quentin, I don't quite understand. Is this a grade average or a draft rating? <laughs> so after I was asked to leave the university, I was admitted to a very small liberal arts college, also in Illinois, which was patterned after the Hutchins plan and the change appeared to be positive and therapeutic. My grade soared, I graduated, and then my girlfriend and I toured Europe for nine months in a 1947 Volkswagen, and I also did a stint at the University of London. Then, at the end of my first year at the graduate Claremont School of Theology, I experienced a psychotic episode which was a definite break far, far from consensual reality. The school responded, me, responded by placing me in a posh, private, supposedly advanced psychiatric hospital, and upon entrance I asked a nurse, is this the Hilton? And she replied, it can be anything you want it to be, sweetheart. <laughs> Although my stay at that hospital was brief, I was misdiagnosed, and for the next seven years, I wandered in the wilderness, as it were, taking the wrong medicine for the wrongly diagnosed malady. During this period of time, I experienced recurrent episodes in Montana, New York City, and Los Angeles. Let me describe briefly what I underwent in Los Angeles. Relaxing in my dorm room, I got a notion. And if you're prone to mental illness, beware of notions that I was selected to save or free Los Angeles from the lost angels. So I ran down to the freeway, climbed upon the shoulder, and proceeded to do a kind of Shakespearean dance. You can imagine how this interrupted traffic. Glanced up at the smog-ridden sky and, and saw vivid portraits of a militant Archbishop of Canterbury, Joan of Arc, and Martin Luther King, who seemed to be egging me on in this pursuit. Well, this little caper 
lasted about seven or eight minutes when three squad cars rushed up, pounced on me, threw on the handcuffs and whisked me off to L.A. County Jail and dragged me literally kicking and yelling into what was known as the jungle. At that time, Darrell Gates was the chief of police. He was notorious for developing the LAPD's brutality into an art form. None of and a heavy dose of which I received because I overstepped or ignored any rules and was totally uncooperative, rebellious, and recalcitrant toward any of the officer's commands. So much so that I was eventually brought before a panel of doctors who asked me to stand up and give my name, none of which I did, of course. Instead, I rose and said, Mania is simply a streetcar toward desire. And then I heard a doctor on my left respond, what we have he here is either a smart-ass poet or prime hospital material. Evidently, the panel opted for the latter, and I was admitted to a California State Hospital within an hour, where I was safe. Upon the onslaught of mental illness, one begins to see oneself and others see you in a new or different light. Suddenly one is perceived as a person with a mental disorder. And among the myriad adjustments to be made, with a modem of perspicacity or foresight, perhaps one will also realize that his or her career or vocational plans or orientation will either have to be highly modified or even relinquished. For example, I was headed for becoming a candidate for the Episcopal priesthood. Well, my bishop intimated that it was premature for me to go along with that plan, meaning Episcopalians might just well be a little crazy, but they're not nuts. <laughs> also, one can be rest assured that one will look at these turn of events or any tragic occurrence in anybody's life differently when one is 25 or again at 30, 40, 50, and on up. In other words, one's full integration of such a dire, devastating, disastrous event takes a lifetime rather than a once and for all resolution. It was not until I was 35 that, in collaboration with an outstanding psychiatrist, that it was revealed and established that during my wandering years, I had experienced a record of depression, mania, depression, mania, depression, mania. Therefore, my correct diagnosis would have to be manic depressive. Finally, I had a diagnostic label which I felt was in sync and congruent with my persona. And I was so glad and elated that I was now perceived as manic depressive that I went around signing all my documents and checks, Quentin Lee Schrader, MD. <laughs> At that time, the preferred treatment for manic depression was a lithium regimen, with which I became compliant for 25 years. And it did provide me with a modicum of stability. However, as every person with a mental, or, uh, as every person with a mental disorder becomes aware, sometimes the best medicines can go awry. The term manic depression was changed to bipolar in the late 1980s, and treatments for that disorder became expanded and more varied. Every time I was hospitalized and released, I felt dehabilitated rather than rehabilitated, so there was a time for a good bit of psychotherapy, which I found to be very helpful. How after, after a while, I found talking it out incessantly was not granting me the progress toward wellness that I was so desperately seeking. So I began to choose my own path toward recovery. First, I completed my master's degree in religious studies because I like to finish what I start. Then I began reading widely challenging and esoteric journals. Also, I immersed myself in live L.A. Philharmonic Classical Music Concerts at the Music Center and the Hollywood Bowl. I also became a culture vulture and saw as many opera, ballet, and legitimate theater as I possibly could. 
All of these activities function for me as an embrace of and participation in the outside world. By engaging in these interests, I was diverted from my bipolar blues, and it also helped in getting me outside of and even transcending myself. Consequently, it did not take me long to realize that in the big picture, I was extremely fortunate and I decided I was going to cease searching for that one and only psychiatrist who supposedly would hold the magic bullet for my wellness. Instead, what I intuitively thought at that particular time, juncture, was me to actively seek employment. So I did, and I acquired a highly satisfying position with the Journalist Division of the Claremont Graduate School, doing and completing a special archivals project the final collection of which was placed in a permanent section of the campus library. This venture proved to myself that I was capable of performing mainstream work and that I ought to continue in that path. When I returned to Helena in order to be a caregiver for my mother, who was afflicted with macular degeneration in her late 80s, in addition, I became more and more intensely involved with the orientation, the goals, and the effective thrust of the NAMI organization, the Alliance for the Mentally Ill. As a result of the vital information gained from, gleaned from that organization, I learned concretely about the biochemical origins of my mental illness and, it evolved, and how it evolved from a genetic predisposition from my paternal grandfather, my father's father, who lived in the 19th century. I also did some research into some of the biographies of whom are known as the beautiful minds and found that my case was hardly unique and that there were several precedents of historical personages who despite their mental illness also achieved outstanding accomplishments. Some of them you might recognize. Sylvia Plath, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Abraham Lincoln, Robert Lowell, Vivian Lee, Patty Duke, Robert Schumann, George Handel, Virginia Woolf, Ernest Hemingway, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Edgar Allan Poe, Alexander Hamilton, Oliver Cromwell, Napoleon Bonaparte, Theodore Roosevelt, Henry Lighthorse Lee, Winston Churchill, Jonathan Edwards, Martin Luther. Those are just a few of the greats. And I've added Robin Williams because he appeared on The Tonight Show, jumped six feet in the air and said, I love my Zoloft. <laughs> Eventually I relinquished my lithium regimen in exchange for some of the atypical psychotropics or designer drugs. I call them designer drugs because they're in vogue, they're very expensive, everybody wants them and they're hard to get. <laughs> All of these enlightening changes I found to be instrumental toward my recovery and it enabled me to function at a high level. However, I do not wish to imply that anyone's process of recovery is always upward, forward, and onward every day. It is not. Rather, the myth of Sisyphus is a more apt metaphor for persons with mental illness because that stone of wellness is never secured at the top of the hill and remains constantly elusive. <coughs> that is why it's important to cultivate a supportive network of friends and acquaintances who affirmatively encourage you to continue on your journey. Now it should be emphasized that in the past, just in the past 10 years, there have been some definite encouragement advancements within the ethos of American culture which point to a further understanding and acceptance of the realities and consequences of being afflicted with mental illness. One aspect of this advancement is that the terms schizophrenia, bipolar, OCD, anxiety and panic disorders along with PTSD are now household words and the topics concerning the occurrence of mental disorders within families, between spouses, or loved ones are freely discussed and have become commonplace. So, with the advance of increased awareness of the prevalence of mental illness and the availability of treatment, 
and the continuing constant searching and recruitment of more highly skilled psychiatrists to come to Montana. Montana, as a community, is dis demonstrating that it is, is on the forefront. All these intentions, of course, will be carried out for the sake of the client's well-being, with an assurance that they will be able to achieve, to maintain, and to sustain their dignity as human beings. Thank you, and thank you again. Quentin's always really hard to follow, follow up, but uh, hopefully that gave you a little bit of an idea of the ups and downs of people's lives with serious mental Ill illness and how their dreams and everything can just be hijacked and taken and they'll move towards recovery and then struggle and fall back and, and keep going. And I think for this audience, it's also important because bad things happen to these people. I mean, legitimately, when you live with a serious mental illness, the world is harder for you. And w that ends up in legal cases, or it may end up with thinking you have a legal case, which isn't always the same thing. But um, got a disclaimer here. and. Uh, I have a J and a D somewhere after my name, so all of this was taken from people that are better qualified. Every, every single bit was either from the NAMI brochures that were developed by docs or uh, from the crisis intervention tra training team, which is law enforcement. And also, please continue to learn because this field is moving faster than any other one that I know. All right. Gen general discussion of mental illness. Um, this is the term that that I use, and it's taken from uh, Dr. Insel, the head of the National Institute of Mental Health, and it's a chronic disruption in neural circuits. And I think we we talk about chemical imb imbalances and stuff, but that's really it. It's a chronic di disruption in neural circuits that affects how someone thinks, feels, and acts. And it often results in a diminished capacity to cope with the strains of ordinary life, meaning calling you back, making it to depositions. Like all, all, all of these things become ch challenging. This is the most important slide. So I'll do my best to try to explain it. Um, nobody knows exactly why mental illnesses exist. Like, like nobody knows this happened, then this happened, then this happened, which is important for those of you that have cases involving it, is if someone says, well, the, you know, the trauma didn't affect that. This person already had bipolar disorder or whatever, the trauma didn't uh, affect that or, you know, they, they, had a, they had depression probably anyway, so it, this, the results of this injury had nothing to do with it. And nobody is smart enough to lock that in. It, if somebody has an expert on one side, look around and I'm sure you'll be able to find one on the other. But this is the way that I saw it. It was introduced to me by a doctor from Cornell a, a couple years ago. And it's called the diathesis stress model. And basically, if you look at it according to the axis on the graph, on the vertical side, I've got bi biological susceptibility. On the horizontal side, and environmental factors. And if you're on this side, you've got the chronic disruption in neural circuits. This side, you're, you're doing okay. And basically, 
all of us are on that spectrum somewhere. Uh, the way that I best saw, saw this was during ra Raider school when we were in the swamps and half starved and awake all the time. Everybody hallucinated there, but everybody hallucinated at different times. I was first. It seemed like I barely had my bag in to, to get in the gate. Uh, but it happened to everybody, you know, and it wasn't chronic, so it wasn't mental illness, but at some point, those neural circuits started to disrupt and they affected how, how we thought, felt, and act. And so everybody's, the biological susceptibility, I think that you have to really specifically force yourself to think of the brain as a muscle or any other kind of organ. It, if you start getting philosophical or whatever, you're gonna fail. So it, it really is biological susceptibility to these illnesses. And it's no different than if one person ha has a cold here, some of us are just naturally gonna, gonna get it. And some of us won't, because the other ones have great immune systems. Um, and, but the other thing is that mm, environmental factors. For instance, tr trauma can br bring you across. My, uh, my stepbrother was here at, after spending time in Iraq on the top of a Humvee. He was there. Pretty simple. Where, where his biological susceptibility was at, it's, it's tough to tell, but at, 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 as one of my friends in the Special Forces said, everybody's got their own size of bathtub that they can take, and, and eventually, if you have enough trauma, it, it's going to spill over. And, uh, but the other thing that's important to point, point out is environmental factors can work in the other way. Support a, a family that's helpful, a therapist that works with you, all these things can affect somebody positively as, as well. Just the same way that alcohol, marijuana, other drugs can, can also hurt. But that's really, if you get nothing else, this is the key. Just the absolute basis of this is why people get these con conditions. It's not hard and fast. And the diagnoses are all over the map. Uh, I think that for a lot of people, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, really hard genetic component. The depression, also genetic, borderline personality disorder is about right in, in the middle b between the mix of uh, biological components and uh, environmental factors. So, NAMI focuses on serious mental illnesses. Uh, we're, we really look at that one in 17 people that actually have the chronic disruption of mental illness. You know, it, not just being blue, not being down for a little while, but really life-threatening issues such as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, major depression, the variety of anxiety disorders and uh, borderline personality disorder. Schi schizophrenia is one of the most challenging <coughs> conditions. Has, it, has anybody represented a client <coughs> with schizophrenia? Yeah? Okay. Um, it <coughs> interferes with a person's ability to think clearly manage their emotions, make decisions, and relate to others. And it's, uh, the reason that is, is because schizophrenia pu pushes on ha hallucinations and delusions. They actually see things that aren't there, here, uh, uh, auditory as well, hear, hear, hearing voices, 
and then the delusions, thinking about conspiracies and other issues. How, how many people get calls from folks that may um, ha, ha, meet that standard? But the big thing is, is um, the medications and the therapies for this co condition is getting a lot better. Um, with <laughs> bipolar disorder, as Quentin described, it's, all, it's also known as manic depression with uh, se severe highs and se severe lows. And each of us are on some level of severe high <coughs> highs and lows. But uh, for someone with bipolar disorder, it is crippling lows and highs that are you can't control. It's well, well beyond measure. Um, I think that <coughs> major depression is one of the least understood of these mental illnesses. It's the most prevalent, but it's really hard to determine whether someone has depression or whether they're just going through a, a tough spot. It's really hard for the person to determine that. We don't have any blood tests or brain scans that can guarantee it. So, but typically I think it says um, it, if you're really unable to function but because of your depression for about three weeks, then it moves into the clinical side. And uh, w one of the parts of depression is the suicidal thinking. For some people, the su suicidal thinking becomes overwhelming. This is the number one cause of disability in, in the country. And um, it and the other mental illnesses are generally tied to about 98% of suicides. Obsessive compulsive disorder is an anxiety disorder <coughs> char characterized by uh, obsessions and compulsions. Obsessions are recurrent involuntary thoughts, ideas or impulses, and uh, compulsions are things that someone does to try to overcome those impulses and again there are varying levels of this I think that you could watch a baseball batter go up to the plate and see the obsessions and compulsions and you know do tapping on the bat with necklaces and stuff I mean that, that that's one thing that I that everybody's ha has to some degree but but the difference between that and <coughs> washing your hands until they bleed to try to get the germs off is an entirely different thing. Pan panic disorder. Um, this is characterized by unexpected and repeated episodes of intense fear, accompanied by physical symptoms such as chest pain, heart palpitations, sh shortness of breath, and uh, if you've ever seen someone undergo a true panic attack, it looks like a heart attack. I mean, it just doubles them over and shuts them down. And um, the episodes are uncontrollable neurological responses to ordinary non-threatening situations. And anybody can have a panic attack, but it becomes clinical when you have four or more per month. And if you have four or more of these things that look and feel like a heart attack per month, all the other times you're thinking about when your next one's going to be. Um, and then you develop anxiety or pho phobias around things that may have caused those attacks. Uh, po Post-traumatic stress disorder, P PTSD, I kind of went into it with my stepbrother, but it's, uh, it's caused by trauma, it's an anxiety disorder, and a, a lot of the same de depression, flashbacks, self-isolation that you see in other conditions. 
and um, and the symptoms usually appear about three three months after an experience or can occur years later so it <coughs> this makes it really hard to determine if it caused it and but it's important to know that it if you've got a trial and if your client says that they developed PTSD from something that <coughs> happened a year ago that could be legit there's a medical basis for that happening that was the whole reason for the screening process that we pushed through Congress was at intervals because it doesn't shut someone down right away everybody experiences trauma in different ways but for people with this biological susceptibility the the medical part of it comes later um, or borderline per personality disorder is really confusing I think um, it's characterized by impulsivity and instability and in mood self image and personal relationships um, they, uh, the way that a clinician at the state hospital described this is because that it's pretty tough to deal with clients that have these conditions and they said uh, just try to think of it as this is someone who had a lot of trauma that wasn't treated and uh, and basically they end up with marked mood swings anger impulsiveness recurring suicidal threats unstable and intense personal relationships chronic bore boredom or fe feelings of em <coughs> emptiness and frantic efforts to avoid abandonment and uh, this is a horrible condition and it's really sad because you see it a lot in kids that have been uh, abused and it changes the wiring in, in, in their brain not always a lot that they can do with this from a pharmaceutical standpoint but the really amazing thing is is there was one woman that had it and was hospitalized repeatedly as a youth and she became a psychologist and developed the most um, amazing treatment for it it's called di dialectical behavioral therapy and it's given people a chance at life and real relationships that wouldn't have had it before important to point out also that these illnesses you often co occur with alcoholism or substance abuse it's just a <coughs> reality almost every call that we get into the NAMI office also involves alcoholism or substance abuse so it's not always but just a very real part of the reality and at, while it's pretty easy to judge on this uh, one woman with, with borderline personality disorder describes it as I am in such pain that I would do it, it, I would take in, anything to make me feel better even if just for an instant and if you think about it bi bi biologically those neural circuits that are flaring off are, are the same ones that flare off when your arms on fire you know there, there's no there's no difference in how the pain can can be caused but bi biologically so it's not surprising Th these are some tips for positive interaction with people who are really symptomatic uh, uh, has, has anybody had an incident in their office when, when you've had to deal with someone that's really symptomatic I don't know it. when we were at Brown and Calzac we had different policies that to try to come up with what would happen if somebody w walked in off the streets and was angry or dangerous and the levels of effectiveness of the policy that we came up with I think could could be debated but it, it, it was something that we need to think about and the keys to successful interaction is communication no matter what you're dealing with another person and their neural circuits are flaring up and really uh, 
affecting where they're at, but it, um, they're still there. And it's important to remain calm, man manage your emotions, be helpful, respectful, and professional. No matter what, you're the attorney. And you're the one that needs it to be in charge of that situation. Uh, indicate a willingness to understand and help. Uh, speak simply and slowly. If this person is having auditory hallucinations or if their adrenaline is, fl is flaring up and if they've got delusions that they're concerned about, if you don't speak slowly and simply, you're going to lose them. It's just like trying to talk to somebody when the radio is blasting. Move, move slowly. Again, it's all about the, uh, the brain stimulation. You've got to overstimulate a brain and fast movements make it worse. Stay positive. Uh, be be aware of your body language and be honest with the person. It always really shocked me when, when I was really just beginning this job at the NAMI office, how I would have someone who was very symptomatic trying to figure out what happened to them. It, if they had a legal case that I should refer on to somewhere, if they needed housing, if they really had been abused like they thought, I, I, it's really hard to figure out what's real and what's not and, um, and to see if there was anything that we could do for them. And it, it always floored me when we'd be wrapped up in these delusions with someone who was really sick and finally I'd just say, you know, I'm sorry, I, I, I've got to go back to work or I, I've got something else that I just need to get done and the person would be like, okay, thanks. And it was baffling to me how that honest level of just worked. And, and, and I think that that's important. Uh, the other thing that's important is to <coughs> obtain emergency aid when necessary. I, I know that when we were developing our in incident plan, we didn't know when to call the po police. We didn't, you know, we thought that that was the last thing that we should do. And to be honest, for someone who's really symptomatic, <coughs> calling the police is not a bad thing. Uh, as Quentin said, it may be the one thing that helps them get the treatment that they need. And it's a, it's a really tough thing. But when someone has a condition that's hijacked, their ability to think rationally if you don't call the police and get them help and get them to a safe place, they're going to go back out onto the street and chances are something's going to ha happen to them. So it's not, it's, it's not as bad as we've been led to b believe. Uh, interaction techniques to avoid. Don't move suddenly. Again, uh, it's all about the brain stimulation. Don't give rapid orders. Don't shout. Don't force a discussion. Uh, the person may be very lost in their hallucinations and delusions. Don't, or they may be very depressed. Don't push it if it's not there. <clears throat> Don't maintain direct eye contact. This was really hard for me to understand, but direct eye contact can be very overstimulating for someone. You know, that's the first thing in the fighting or whatever, and uh, for some people, their brain are just too stimulated to take direct eye contact. Um, don't touch the person unless necessary for safety, and don't crowd the person or move into their zone of comfort. One of the things that uh, Wells Fargo did at, after we gave him this talk was actually they take the policy of bringing the individual into a room just to not only not crowd them, but to give them their own space while they cool down. And it did really help. Don't express ang anger, in impatience, or irritation. Um, don't assert, assume that someone who can't hear you or that, that 
someone that doesn't respond can't hear. They're still in there, even though their brain may be failing to get them to speak. Um, don't, don't use inflammatory language such as crazy or psycho. Really important, don't challenge hall hallucinatory or delusional statements. Uh, at, as we tell our families over and over in our family to family class, don't try to be rational with an irrational person. For someone who is experiencing that, who is perceiving something, it's as real to them as this podium is. Their brain is telling you it's real. Uh, and whether or not it, it is goes into probably some weird fo philosophy stuff that Quentin studied that back at Chicago. But for them, it's there. And get around it. Don't mislead the person and don't threaten them. So that, that's really the, the wrap up. The, the, the other thing I have is, is if you guys have questions or get stuck with a case, give, it, give us a call. And, the, and we can try to at least guide you through it some. But uh, the, the other thing is, even though you may not be taking cases from the one in, se in 17 people <coughs> affected by these conditions, one in five families are, have a family member and they're living this. And if you've got a family member with this, it totally disrupts your life on a very regular basis. So please be compassionate with those families. Thank you. Rick. Hey, Matt. Uh, under major depression, I'm just surprised to read uh, therapy being electroconvulsive therapy. What's that? You know, there, there's... Um, we're all through with that. Yeah, great, great question. Um, so the question is, is uh, uh, electroconvulsive ther therapy, and it's actually become pretty amazing that they've had breakthroughs on that, and there are people that it works for. Uh, pe people that pharmaceutical drugs don't work for, uh, that they, they tried transmagnetic uh, drugs, and, or tri magnets on the brain and uh, but really they're going back to the uh, uh, electricity. The only difference is is like some of the electric things in the 50s and 60s and, and the 70s it's not that. Uh, but, 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 but there was a great article in the New York Times um, and it's pasted up on our NAMI news about uh, the woman who had a um, bipolar depression that the movie uh, uh, what's it Homeland or the t the TV show on Showtime Homeland uh, that it, that she's based on used electroconvulsive therapy and, and it's shot it, it's it, it's surprising but it's it, it's com it's coming back and there's even Dr. Fred Freeze said uh, and he's one of the most renowned psychologists in the country. Said in 20 years, we'll all be, we'll all go back to electricity and magnets for the brain and move away from pharmaceuticals. One other question: you could, uh, I know you're involved in the military aspects. You know, guys coming back from the war and PTSD treatment. <clears throat> With this this lapse, this time lapse you talked about, I'm assuming most of those folks come back and they're. They've got it when they get back, but are some of them coming back and not having it right away? And then are they being challenged on their benefits? Yeah, yeah. Is that I, any, are most? Is there a percentage you can do that how many of them are accepted or not accepted for PTSD that come back? Is it are most of them accepted? Well, I think that the if they're at, I, I don't have a specific n number. But, but I think that what we see, we, we don't see that that as often. Like, like they, they've gotten pretty good, a little bit better about not saying that we need to see, you know, when you were shot at, when, you know, they just became less stupid about 
some some of those things but but what I've seen that that's really troubling is is these diagnoses the similarity in the conditions I don't know if you saw that as you're going through <coughs> like to, to claim that someone had borderline personality disorder before they entered the military um, and that their combat trauma had nothing to do with it They're saying they say that sometimes, or or they'll say you know now that like one member of the National Guard that had a bipolar disorder, and they said you know you you had that before you came, this had nothing to do with the trauma, and uh, as you saw from that graph, there's no way to really prove that. No, si science is not as good as they're claiming to that I bet benefits. So it, if you're doing a pro bono case or something with a, a veteran that's fighting that, there's a lot, like, there's a, a lot of medical ambigu ambiguity and anybody that claims that there's not, there's always somebody else to fight them. The, the, does that help? Right? Yeah. One last question? Yep. Just by the simple numbers, we obviously are representing people with these problems, whether we know it or not. And almost never do we get, a, at least that I see, we'll quite often get veiled references, you know, maybe they're suffering from mild depression, maybe we'll add, you know, Zoloft or whatever to med pain medications. But do the medical doctors really understand this stuff? Is there a better place we can be sending our people? So psychiatrist I think is it is when when you're going for a diagnosis I think the the two main folks that do it are psychiatrists and psychologists and uh, but as these things come up call us we we'll do our best to try to give you somebody in in, in your area and uh, somebody that might be be able to say, you know, because of this trauma, this is why the person's not working, and that's standard okay. for these conditions. So. There's almost never a psychiatric referral except for a neuropsych for a brain injury, and if your numbers are even remotely close, then most of these are going undiagnosed, right? Yeah, I think that I think that there's a lot of uh, of lack of diagnosis, uh, especially until somebody gets gets more involved. But whether or not they reveal it to to you or know about it, because often these don't really come up until someone's in their mid twenties or early twenties. So uh, they don't even know that they have it until something goes dramatically bad. Is it basically a last straw type of a thing then? Could the trauma of an injury then make somebody to the point where they need treatment, where they function fine without it before then? Bingo. The, uh, the, the question was, was could the trauma of an injury cause, uh, cause someone to go into a depression to the point where they now need treatment where they didn't before? And yes. I think un undeniably yes. So if now someone, like a, if they are now at the far side of that line, if their bathtub is filled up and spilled over, they may need treatment, they may need counseling, and it may, they may need it for the rest of their life. So th thank you, and our, our website is NAMIMT dot org uh, phone number 406-443-7871 thank you